Welcome to our webinar on World Environment Day 2018. The title of the webinar is, Is it still possible to save the future? My name is Cecilia O'Dwyer. I'm a Loreto sister working for my congregation at the United Nations. With me are five sisters from different religious congregations. We have, as you'll see here on the uh, screen, Sister Cynthia Matthew, Congregation of Jesus, Sisters Catherine Prendergast and Margaret O'Dwyer from the Daughters of Charity, Sister Elsa Mutatu from International Presentation Association, and Sister Celine Paramunda from the Medical Missionary Sisters. We represent our congregations at the United Nations where we work as part of civil society. An important aspect of our work here is to make the voice and concerns of the people we serve around the world present in the discussions and the policy making for the global community, which is what happens at the United Nations. We know that among the many huge global concerns, we have climate change and the devastation of our ecosystems. And in this respect, World Environment Day offers us a good opportunity to take stock of where we are and where we need to go. World Environment Day occurs on the 5th of June every year and was first held in 1974. That's a long time ago now, 44 years. It all began at a UN conference on human environment in 1972. The discussions were on human interactions and the environment and what they discovered there led to the need to raise awareness about what we humans are doing to the environment. So in 1974, the first World Environment Day was held. Back then, 44 years ago, not many of us were aware of the, the deterioration of the environment that we humans were causing. A few perhaps, but the vast majority of, of the world population was totally unaware. Therefore, celebrating World Environment Day has helped raise awareness worldwide on issues related to the environment. It has become a global platform for marine pollution to global warming and sustainable consumption and wildlife crimes. Every World Environment Day has a different global host country where the official celebrations take place. This year it is India and each World Environment Day is organized around the theme that focuses attention on a particularly pressing environmental concern. This year the theme is Beat Plastic Pollution. Modern technology gives us this amazing opportunity we have today of speaking with you. We want to make the most of it and share with you from our experience of immersion in these issues at the United Nations. We hope it will be a valuable and enjoyable experience for you. I'll pass you over now to our moderator for the webinar. Thank you, Cecilia, for that. Hi, friends. I'm Cynthia. In this webinar, we are going to hear about the spiritual and ethical framework of Laudatasi, the celebration of the World Environment Day, the plastic and its effect on our environment, environment and human rights, climate change and migration, environment within the framework of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and some examples of good practices. If you have any questions, you can type it in the, bar, provide, the place provided in the sidebar or the chat box, and we will try to answer at the end of the presentation as time permits. Thank you. Now I pass on to Celine, who will speak about Laudata Si. Thank you. I want to offer some reflections through the lens of Laudato Si. 
Pope Francis added Laudato Si to the body of the church's social teaching to acknowledge the urgency of the challenge we face. Laudato Si begins with, praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us and who produces various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. What a beautiful picture of environment. Now let us go back to the creation story, Genesis chapter 131. And God saw everything he had made and behold, it was good. God set aside the seventh day for rest. And now the question, what if God look at the same earth today? Will God be happy? Is it still good? Listen to Pope Francis. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. Can we really rest when our mother earth groans in pain? How did we reach where we are now? Pope says, the violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. She groans in travail. In 1971, eight years after Pachem and Teres, St. Paul, Paul VI referred to the ecological concern as a tragic consequence of unchecked human activity. The misuse of creation begins when we no longer recognize any higher instance than ourselves, when we see nothing else but ourselves. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew has spoken of the need for each of us to repent of the ways we have harmed the planet, for in as much as we all generate small ecological damage, we are called to acknowledge our contribution smaller or greater to the disfigurement and destruction of creation. Do we ever consider confessing our ecological sins? On climate change, there's a clear, definitive and ineluctable ethical imperative to act, says Pope Francis. No matter what the original charisms of our unique congregations, caring for the earth is a common challenge. How do we do it together as disciples of Jesus and responsible citizens of earth is the question. Do we have a model? Yes, Pope Francis point out to St. Francis Assisi as the example par excellence of care for the vulnerable and of an integral ecology lived out joyfully and authentically. He shows us just how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society and interior peace. We need to strengthen the conviction that we are one single human family. We are one no matter how the divisive forces try to play on our differences. Basically, we are all one earth citizens and children of God. We need to care for one another for peace and harmony. Since environmental deterioration and human and ethical degradation are closely linked, we need a conversation which includes everyone. Actually, the environmental challenge we are undergoing, its human roots and concern affect us all. The good news is that the worldwide ecological movement has already made considerable progress and led to the establishment of numerous organizations committed to raising awareness of these challenges. We require a new and universal solidarity as the Bishop of Southern, uh, Southern Africa has stated, everyone's talents and involvement are needed to redress the damage caused by human abuse of God's creation. Pope Francis says, the creator does not abandon us. He never forsakes his loving plan or repents of having created us. 
humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. Here I want to recognize, encourage, and thank all those striving in countless ways to guarantee the protection of the home which we share. Let us, let us be protectors of creation, protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature, protectors of one another and of the environment. Is it still possible to protect our planet? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks, Sister Celine. I would like to give you a little more information about the World Environment Day and how you can get involved in this celebrations. The United Nations Environment Program, known as UNEP, which was set up in 1972, is a leading global environmental authority that sets the global environmental agenda, promotes the coherent implementation of the environmental dimensions of the sustainable development within the United Nations system, and serves as an authoritative advocate for the global environment. With Beat plastic pollution as a theme for this year's edition. The world is coming together to combat single-use plastic pollution. It urges governments, industry, communities, and individuals to come together and explore sustainable alternatives and urgently reduce the production and excessive use of single-use plastic, polluting our oceans, damaging our marine life, and threatening human health. World Environment Day is the People's Day for doing something to take care of the Earth. That something can be focused locally, nationally, and globally. It can be a solo action or involve a crowd. Everyone is free to choose. For example, I'm sure all of you have read about it. Rajeshwari Singh, a 32-year-old from Badodara in Western India, is on her way to Delhi on foot traveling through 22 major cities and covering more than 1,100 kilometers. She has chosen the theme, My Waste, My Responsibility, for her walk to create awareness about pollution caused by plastic. This initiative of the young lady is being supported by the local government and the United Nations Environment Program. Next slide, please. Uh, in recent years, Cecilia, next slide. In recent years, millions of people have taken part in thousands of registered activities worldwide. For me, more details, please visit the website. You can see on the screen, www.environment.org or www.worldenvironmentday.global. Get in touch with UNEP running the regional plans for the day, which is available on the website. Thank you. Now I invite Sister Catherine to tell us about the plastic and its effect on our environment. Thank you, Cynthia. I want to reflect a little with you on the problem with plastic. It seems to be a common thing in history that the things that lead to great progress and convenience also come at a great price. It seems to be very true with plastic products and packaging. There is no denying that inexpensive plastic has made distribution much easier, though I would argue that is problematic as well. Next slide. I personally am convinced that our health and the health of the planet is much better off if we drastically reduce our use of plastic. Next slide. And here's why. There are chemicals in plastics commonly known as BPA They've gotten media exposure about their potential health difficulties. Next slide. 
and there are much more problems than a few uh, isolated cases of BPA. Because B now BPA is often added to make plastic more durable, but it also it is often given to animals such as cows and chickens to cause them to gain weight before slaughter. Next slide. From the journal of the Yale Environmental Studies, I quote, there is also now an abundance of research that links BPA to health concerns such as deformities in the male and female genitals, increased breast and prostate cancer, infertility, miscarriages, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. That's to mention just some. It seems to me at this point that it is widely known that plastics from food packaging can leach into food and into the body. Next slide. Plastic and the planet. Plastics are literally taking over the earth at an amazing rate. When we consider how long it takes for plastics to break down and the high level of plastic pollution found even in areas that are uninhabited, such as, as you see here, like ice and water in Antarctica, we can start to understand how big the problem of plastic pollution can be. Next slide. Now, we are invited to commit to reuse. Over one million plastic bags are used every year worldwide. That is approximately one million bags a minute. A single bag can take up to 1,000 years to degrade. Plastic bags remain toxic even after they break down. Every square mile of ocean has about 46,000 pieces of plastic floating in it. In 2015, studies attempted to measure how much microplastic is in the world's oceans Descri and described the plastic microparticles of the ocean as creating in the waters a soup. So the waters are turned into a soup because the estimated number of plastics in 2014 ranged from 15 to 51 trillion pieces, weighing between 93,000 and 236 metric tons. Next slide. A recent study shows that plastic debris also also attracts marine organisms, causing them to confuse plastic with food. More than 50 species of fish have been found to consume plastic thrash at sea. This is bad news, not only for the fish, but potentially, <clears throat> next slide, also for humans who rely on fish as a food source. Fish do not usually die as a direct result of feeding on an enormous quantity of plastic trash 
floating on the ocean, which means that fishermen are catching these fish live and are, they are being sold on the market. Numerous species sold for human consumption include mackerel, bass, Pacific oysters, and they have been found with toxic plastic in their stomachs. The plastics are widely considered safe by regulatory agencies, but in most cases, it is because they are not being tested are tested in small quantities. So what can we do? One big thing that we can do is reduce the amount of plastic products that we use and buy. This reduces our personal exposure and the planet's exposure to plastic. Other ways, reduced plastic exposure can include starting to use glass and stainless steel, but water bottles and thermos, using metal and glass dishes, silverware and bakeware, switching to reusable grocery bags, Stop buying processed foods that are packaged in plastics. Replace plastic bags and plastic food storage containers with safer, reusable options such as glass, stainless steel or silicon. Buy wooden and metal toys for children, which also last longer. Through these steps, we can decrease our plastic usage and begin to make strides <laughs> against plastic pollution. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sister Catherine, for reminding us how important it is to beat the plastic pollution. Okay, friends, I would like to bring to your attention how the environment and human rights are interconnected. Environmental degradation and human rights was first placed on the international agenda in 1972 at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. Principle one of the Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment establishes a foundation for linking human rights and environmental protection, declaring that man has a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being, and he bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. As a result of the 1972 conference, the United Nations Environment Program, known as UNEP, was set up. Human beings depend on the environment in which we live. A safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is integral to the full enjoyment of a wide range of human rights, including the rights to life, health, food, water, and sanitation. Without a healthy environment, we are unable to fulfill our aspirations or even live with minimum standards of human dignity. It is generally acknowledged that a healthy environment is a precondition to the full enjoyment of a wide range of human rights, including the right to life itself. Human rights and the environment are not only inter interrelated, they are also interdependent. This link has been addressed by the wide array of international and regional instruments, organizations, and mechanisms including human rights treaty bodies, United Nations resolutions and special procedures and multilateral environmental agreements. The environment issues are human rights issues. Next slide, please. More than 2 million annual deaths and billions of 
cases of diseases are attributed to pollution. All over the world, people experience the negative effects of environmental degradation, ecosystems decline, including water shortage, fisheries depletion, natural disasters due to deforestation and unsafe management and disposal of toxic and dangerous waste and products. Indigenous people suffer directly from the degradation of ecosystems that they rely upon for their livelihoods. Climate change is exacerbating many of these negative effects of environmental degradation on human health and well-being, and is also causing new ones, including an increase in extreme weather events and an increase in spread of malaria and other vector-borne diseases. These facts clearly show the close linkages between the environment and the enjoyment of human rights and justify an integrated approach to environment and human rights. In a series of resolutions, United Nations Human Rights Council have drawn attention to the relationship between a safe and healthy environment and the enjoyment of human rights. Most recently, the Human Rights Commission Council in its resolution focused specifically on human rights and climate change, noting that climate change related effects have a range of direct and indirect implications for the effective enjoyment of human rights. These resolutions have raised awareness of how fundamental the environment is as a prerequisite to the enjoyment of human rights. The United Nations Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights adopted a general comment in 2002 on the right to water referring to Article 11 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. The general comment states, the human right to drinking water is fundamental for life and health. Sufficient and safe drinking water is a precondition for the realization of all human rights. More recently, in 2010, the United Nations General Assembly has recognized the right to water and the Human Rights Council has appointed an independent expert on the issue of human rights obligations related to the enjoyment of safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Two days ago, the UN General Assembly has taken a first step toward establishing a global pact for the environment in a move opposed by the United States, Russia, and a handful of other nations. The pact would be aimed at finding gaps in protection of the environment around the globe and taking steps to address them. Everyone is becoming aware of the importance of protecting the environment in order to protect and safeguard the inalienable human rights of all because the violation of the right to a safe and healthy environment is the violation of human rights. Thank you. The next speaker is Sister Margaret, who will tell us something about climate change, which is one of the drivers of migration and internally displaced people. Sister Margaret. Hold a minute now. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you put your screen now, okay? Yep. Right. Can you see the screen now? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, no, it's gone again. It's gone, Margaret. Yeah, now that's it. Okay. Good. That's as we it. approach as we approach Environment Day, another issue to consider is climate change and migration. You know and I know that there are climate change deniers. But 97% of actively publishing climate scientists agree that climate warming trends are related to human activity. Earth temperatures have risen more than one degree Fahrenheit or 0 0.08 degrees Celsius over the last century. It's twice that in the Arctic. Greenhouse gases are higher than in hundreds of thousands of years. Glaciers and ice sheets are melting and sea level is on the rise. It would be no surprise to you to know that key carbon emitters 
are from the industrialized nations or first world countries. The top emitters are China, the US, India, Russia, and Japan. Let's take a look for a moment about key impacts of climate events in 2017. There were heavy rains in places like Sierra Leone and Vietnam and many other places. 80% of food insecure people live in zones that are hazard prone. It was the second year of major bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef and that affects marine life profoundly. 30% of the world population experienced extreme heat waves. 41 million were affected by floods in South Asia alone. There was major destruction in the Caribbean with hurricanes. Hundreds of thousands of people in Somalia were displaced within their country by drought. And there were destructive wildfires around the world. Now, Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and former commissioner of human rights for the United Nations, says climate change is the greatest threat to human rights in the century. You can imagine people who have to move due to drought and flood uh, are looking for the fulfillment of their rights to food, shelter, clean water, health and education and more. Big cities are not equipped to handle people who move into them because of climate issues. You remember the Paris Agreement became effective in November of 2016. It calls for the world to keep temperature rise well below two degrees, but to aim for keeping it below 1.5 degrees in this century. How are we doing on that? Well, a report is due by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in September. That shows at the current rate, we're going to surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius of a climate temperature rise by 2040. Now, 1.5 degrees Celsius is risky. It puts reefs at risk, the Arctic could be nearly ice free, and ocean chemistry will change but a two degree temperature rise is even riskier because it caused more profound floods, droughts, water scarcity, reduced crops, the extinction of species, disease, hunger, migration, and conflict for resources. And an extra 10 centimeter sea level rise would happen uh, over a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase poor and coastal communities are going to be hit the hardest due to things like crop failures, people losing their livelihoods, food prices spiking in urban areas, fish catches going down, and storm surge in coastal areas. Sea level has risen by an eighth of an inch per year, and this profoundly affects many of our nations in the Pacific and other uh, oceans. Let's look now at climate migration, which refers essentially to people who must move either inside or outside of their country because of climate factors like extreme temperatures, floods and droughts, rises in sea level, tsunamis, coastal erosion, desertification and other hazards. Uh, Pope Francis said there has been a tragic rise in the number of migrants seeking to flee from the growing poverty caused by environmental degradation. So climate migration really is, is spurred by first climate change, but affects most profoundly people who are poor. You may ask me, how many environmental migrants are there? The prediction is between 25 million to 1 billion by 2050 but the most commonly quoted statistic is 200 million people having to move due to environmental issues by 2050. Um, now people moving inside their own country, 
the estimate for that is over 140 million people needing to move by 2050, with about 40 million of them being in South Asia. But Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America are also affected. People move either because of slow onset events, like sea level rise in Tuvalu, as you see, or droughts in Thailand and Africa. Um, the United Nations says that 135 million people may be displaced by 2045 because of land turning to desert. The second kind of climate issue that causes people to move are rapid onset events. You know these. E events like Typhoon Haiyan, which displaced 4 million people in the Philippines. About 26 pe million people are displaced by disasters like floods and storms every year. That's one person per second. Asia is profoundly affected. Eight in 2015, 85% of people displaced by sudden onset disasters were in South and East Asia. There were profound flood floods in Vietnam, fires in Indonesia. Puerto Rico was profoundly affected by a hurricane. Uh, a professor from Cardiff University estimates that India will have about 30 million environmental migrants by uh, within 50 years. And you can see in Somalia at the picture below, they have profound drought. There's more people displaced by disasters, new displacements, 24.2 million in 2016, compared to 6.9 million people displaced by conflict. Climate migrants are in a no man's land because they are not covered by the 1951 Refugee Convention. They um, are not considered as being persecuted. So there's no official right to stay in another country for asylum or to get other protection. The Global Compact for Migration now being negotiated at the UN does recognize environmental issues as a driver of migration, but there's no appetite right now for leaders to give refugee status to people who must move because of climate related issues. So we use a human rights approach and advocate for people's rights to food, shelter, education, health, and things like that. Uh, there's a climate in index, which shows how countries are doing in uh, performing on their efforts to reduce uh, climate change. You can see the red are not doing well, but also the green places like India, and Scandinavia, France, Morocco, uh, doing fairly well. What can you do? You can encourage your country to uh, commit to implementing its agreement under the Paris Climate Pact. We have to reduce carbon emissions globally. Plant trees, reduce our consumption, educate people about climate issues, and welcome those who have been displaced by climate events. And we can reduce our carbon footprint by being energy efficient, contacting our local leaders and telling them we want action on climate change. We can hang out our clothes to dry rather than using a dryer, do a home energy audit, ask our utility to use clean energy, a great percentage of greenhouse gases come from meat. So eat less of it. Uh, tell stores we don't want plastic pack packaging. Fly less and carpool. Here is a reference to a site that's a good site for ideas for fighting climate change. 101 ways to fight climate change. So on June 5th, World Environment Day, let's each commit to take action to protect our climate and our Earth. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Sister Margaret, for giving us a lot of information about climate change and its impact, especially on migrants and people living in the extreme poverty and, get, and making us aware the need to do something in order to fight for this. So now I pass on to 
uh, Sister Elsa to share about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Environment. Sister Elsa. Um, thank you, Cynthia. At the close of the Millennium okay, Development... Sorry. Elsa, would you, would you just click on share screen? Okay. Because it, we, we don't see it on, on this yet. Oh, sorry, just one minute. I, yeah. uh, okay. Um, Do you see the little icon there? Share screen. One minute, let me, let me go back on it. Uh, see, I think this, uh, I am not able to get to that because, okay. Is it coming? Do you see it? No. Margaret, did you click on again on share screen so that you you would uh, there it is there it is there you are yeah great <laughs> okay okay yeah Fine. good that's it okay at the close of the millennium development goals all of the 193 countries that are members of the united nations came together in september 2015 and adopted a new universal shared plan of action to eradicate poverty, guarantee human rights for all, strengthen peace, and heal our planet by 2030. This collective journey that the world has set forth on is called Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In this new agenda, governments have committed to take the bold and transformative steps which are urgently needed to shift the world onto a sustainable path. A main part of this is the set of 17 sustainable development goals that each country will try to reach. But what is sustainable development, go development and where does it come from? The most commonly accepted definition of sustainable development as development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs came from our common future the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987. The concept of sustainable development first originated in 1972 at the United Nations Conference on Human Environment, known as the Stockholm Conference in Sweden. Two key aspects of the sustainable development are meeting human needs, and sustaining the planet. At the 1992 UN Conference on Environmental Development held in Rio de Janeiro, known as the Earth Summit, the, Human Commission, the UN Commission on Sustainable Development was established. In 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development was held in Johannesburg to assess progress since Rio. Since Rio. The Earth Summit 2012, known as Rio Plus 20, resulted in a document, The Future We Want, that formed the basis for the next three years of negotiations, resulting in the 2030 Transformative Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. One of the significant aspects of the 2030 Transformative Agenda is the integration of the three pillars of development, social, economic, and environmental, which are also, which were so far considered separately. Secondly, it is framed within the human rights framework. The vision of the 2030 Transformative Agenda is summarized in the five P's, people, planet, peace, prosperity, and partnership. The action agenda for the transformative vision as laid out in 
17 goals, 169 targets, and 232 indicators provide a roadmap to achieve sustainable development. Most of the UN programs are centered around the achievement of these goals, and the high-level political forum at the UN is the forum where countries voluntarily share their national progress. We as NGOs also have opportunities to report on our own as well as the country's progress of implementation. Preserving and restoring the planet is the main component of the 2030 Agenda. Natural resource depletion and adverse impacts of environmental degradation, including desertification, drought, land degradation, freshwater scarcity, and loss of diversity, biodiversity, add to the list of challenges which humanity faces, including extreme poverty. This is further intensified by the consumption and production patterns that overlook the needs of future generations to satisfy the greed of the present generation and increase inequality. The SDGs, sorry, the SDGs are universal and indivisible. They apply to all nations and all peoples. No one SDG can be fully achieved without achieving the others. For example, thriving, the sustain, thriving and sustainable cities depend on cross-societal partnerships, as well as clean water and green energy for all, which are in turn dependent upon the care of our ecosystems and earth community. The World Environment Day celebrations with the theme, Beat the Plastic Pollution, are specially targeted towards the achievement of SDG 13, as well as other environment-related SDGs 6, 7, 12, 14, and 15. While SDG 13 directly deals with climate change, other SDGs are linked to the causes and consequences of climate change. Water and energy SDGs 6 and 7 are very closely linked to SDG 5 on gender equality, SDG 8 on decent work, SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production, as well as SDGs 14 and 15 relating the health relating to the health of the oceans and terrestrial health. The issue of sustainability is one that belongs to everybody because the issue of our environment and the depletion in resources is one that will affect generations to come regardless of locations. Just to give you one example from Ghana that uses children's play power board to generate electricity to power the lanterns. So can we join hands to save our planet? If we carefully look at SDGs and our ministries, we can align all our ministries with relevant SDGs and engage local communities and others using the national plan on SDGs to transform the situations of poverty and environmental degradation. A four-step approach is helpful. First, need assessment in communities through participatory listening survey. Second, need analysis to understand the immediate and root causes of the problem. Step three, educate on the linkages between the local needs and the potential of the SDGs to address these needs. Step four, initiate small strategic, strategic actions that has the potential for long-term impact. So SDGs, when targeted correctly, can transform not only the physical realities, 
but also provide vision, direction, and concrete actions that are transformative. I like to offer you a resource for education, which is critical hope for SDGs. You can see that here on the link, and the link is there. And there are also other programs for which the link is available. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Sister Elsa, for that. Now I invite Sister Celine to give us a few examples of best practices. We have heard from our speakers the best practices being practiced in different parts of the world. Catherine, Margaret, and Elsa have alluded to that. When plastic take over the earth, we need to remember alternatives. But I, I would like to remind each one of us what the words of ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. Our contribution, smaller or greater, to the disfigurement and destruction of creation, meaning we are all part of the problem, so we need to be part of the solutions. The good news is there are so many organizations and initiatives to replace plastic with paper, bamboo, wood, steel, etc. For example, in the United States alone, a single-use plastic straw is used 500 million a day, which is equal to covering the entire circumference of the earth 2.5 times a single day. So there is a movement to use stainless steel straws. I don't want to go into details, but we have a lot of websites like 100 Steps to a Plastic Free Life, My Plastic Free Life, Meatless Mondays, and uh, several initiatives. As we are closer, close, closer to the uh, Environment Day, the question is, what can we do individually and as a community and as nations? And since we have uh, less time, I go into reminding each one of the five R's. Refuse to get unnecessary stuff and reduce our, our consumptions. Reuse whenever possible and recycle and replace plastic. So with these thoughts, I would like to hear from all of you are participants. What are the local alternatives you are taking, the best practice you could share with us? Because we all can learn from one another. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sister Celine, for reminding us about the good practices we can have in at local, regional, and national level. Uh, I don't see any questions. So once again, thanks to our presenters and to each of you for joining us today. Hope you all remember what each presenter discussed. We spoke about Laudata Si, the plastic and its effect on our environment, the interconnectedness of environment and human rights, climate change and migration, environment and United Nations sustainable development goals, and we have given a few examples of good practices, which most of you are already aware and working on them. Once again, thanks for joining us. Let's work together to make our environment a better place for us and the future generation to live. Thank you to everyone and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.